Okay, last test review of the semester. You recognize some old friends or foes on this slide? Yep, I've included the Hindu and Buddhist art matching questions on this test, as well as the new Unit 7 matching questions, which are up on Moodle for unlimited attempts. I've also included Asian art questions from your Unit 4 test. So why are we putting sticks and lumps of coal into your Christmas stockings? Well, when we put this unit together, we faced a choice. Really, we faced a dilemma. We could use religion as a unit organizing theme, which is what we've done in the past. Or we could teach Asian works all together in a lump. Our compromise was to teach Hindu, Buddhist, and Muslim works together so that we could relate this art to religious beliefs and practices, as well as to the national cultures that produced them. But this left us with a rump of Asian works that became this short unit. As I went through Chinese, Korean, and Japanese art in my podcast, I tried to fit Buddhist art back into the mental timeline. And now Buddhist as well as Hindu art is back on your test as well. The good news is that no Hindu or Buddhist art questions will appear on your semester final. We'll also open the Unit 4 test for your review. All of the questions on Buddhist and Hindu art come from that test. The semester final, in turn, will not have matching questions, but it will have 200 questions from previous unit tests, including Islamic art questions from Unit 4. All of these unit tests will be open for review during a window, so you should do great if you review your tests. I also recommend running through the matching tests one more time, even though they won't be on the semester final, just to make sure you have the work straight in your head. You're going to want to go back and review these more as we get closer to the AP exam. Think of them as your personal flashcards. Well, I already warned you that your unit essay test, which will actually count as part of your semester final test grade, is going to ask you to compare the Forbidden City to another Chinese architectural complex. Well, I got soft as I prepared this test review podcast, and I'm giving you a huge hint. This is the photos of the other work, and I'll give you a couple more huge hints. Think Beijing and think a sacred as well as political space. Remember, you can use one note card on the test. Well, are those Chinese dynasties all jumbling around in your head? Here's a cheat sheet to help you establish a timeline and to try to keep the required work straight. Do not, however, get into a panic about this. Just do your best with this confusing history. I don't know if it helps you to insert Asian history into a timeline with history from other regions. It does help me. So, think about the Han Dynasty as being about the same time as the Roman Republican Empire. In other words, it straddles either side of that BCE-CE divide. The Tang Dynasty comes at about the same time as Muhammad's life and the great Muslim conquest of the Middle East, Central Asia, North Africa, and Spain. Charlemagne also established his empire during the Tang Dynasty. I just note that by almost every measure, Chinese civilization <clears throat> was wealthier and more advanced than European civilization at the time, although some of the Islamic caliphates could give them a run for their money. The Ming Dynasty comes at about the same time Europe enters the Renaissance and the Age of Exploration, and eventually the Europeans came calling in China, first to purchase tea, silk, and porcelain, and then later during the Qing Dynasty to throw their weight around. We talked a little about Mao, but not about what came after Mao. China is still a communist country to this day, and I would argue its rulers are still trying to prove that they hold the mandate of heaven. If you take AP Comparative Government your senior year, you'll learn more about this. I used to teach that course. I think it's very interesting. At any rate, after Mao's death, the country opened up economically and is now an economic superpower. Politically, however, the leaders have tried to keep a tight lid on free speech. I'll talk more about that in a minute. I think Korean history is easier. Silla was one of the three kingdoms, and it produced the Golden Jade Crown. Ties with China grew much closer during the Tang Dynasty and also during Mongol rule, the Yuan Dynasty. Korea pretty much adopted the Neo-Confucian philosophies, that is, governing philosophies, social philosophies, and examination systems of China, but Buddhism remained the state religion. The Joseon dynasty ruled around the same time as the Ming and Qing dynasties in China, and it had close ties with them. The portrait of an imperial official dates from this period. And recall, I at least had a hard time uh, telling it from Ming dynasty portraits, official portraits of the time, although that may reflect my own ignorance. I'm not expert in Asian art. 
After Japanese occupation, World War II and Korea split into North and South, Korea developed a dynamic economy and eventually a much freer and more democratic political system in the South. North Korea is one of the world's most repressive regimes. Uh, it has South Korea has strong ties to the West, and by the way, about 30% of the South Korean population is now Christian. Our global contemporary Korean work, Summer Trees, is heavily influenced by 20th century abstract painting, which we'll meet in the spring, but also by the Chinese and Korean traditions of the literati, of ink wash paintings, and of the spare, austere nature paintings that are partly inspired by Buddhism. It's one of my favorites among the global contemporary works. On to Japan. The great temple complex at Todaiji was built during the Nara period, when the imperial court was, frankly, trying to strengthen its position by adopting Buddhism as a state religion and by impressing its powerful and somewhat scary Tang Dynasty neighbors with the huge Chinese-style temple complex that the Japanese emperors built at Todaiji. A lecturer that I listened to when I was preparing my own podcast compared building the Todaiji with hosting the Olympics. Hey, look, we're rich and powerful, too. We share religion, too. Don't mess with us, okay? Well, we don't have works from the Heian period with its aristocratic court culture, though I did show you some of these, and although these paintings influence the later Yamato-e painting. Military rulers took over in 1185, and in 1600, the Tokugawa shogunate pretty much shut Japan off from the world. Japanese history paintings with warlike themes became very popular, lots of samurai brandishing swords and, of course, later guns. But Zen and Pure Land Buddhism, among other forms of Buddhism, also influenced Japanese art. Uh, and we see this especially in our Zen garden at Ryoanji and in the nature paintings such as uh, white and red plum blossoms. Yamato A painting took a tor turn toward middle class taste during the Edo period. That's when the Japanese uh, imperial, well, Japanese capital was established at Edo or Tokyo. So we see lots of stylized nature themes that also reflected the Zen Buddhist influence. In the early 19th century, woodblock prints provided relatively inexpensive art for the middle classes and made a huge impression on European and American artists. In the 20th century, Japan brought us World War II in the Pacific, Sony transistors, Toyota and Honda cars, Nintendo and anime. Our global contemporary work, Pure Land, mixes Zen, excuse me, Pure Land Buddhism with computer Game style elves. You've probably guessed it is not one of my favorite works. Whew. The history of three major countries in what, five minutes? The ghost of history teachers past may haunt me this Christmas. It, they should haunt me this Christmas. I deserve it. Anyway, on to our works. I warned that this work would appear on the test, which is a little mean since I didn't have time to discuss it. But I'm worried about all of the global contemporary works that we're going to be throwing at you in the spring. And I thought it made sense to introduce this one now, especially since it pairs so appropriately with Chairman Mao. I just gave you a little crash course in recent Chinese history. The Cultural Revolution of 1966 to 1976 was Mao's attempt to maintain revolutionary fervor after his great leap forward turned out to be more like a great leap into a very deep pit. The body count may go as high as 40 million people. If you want to know more, and I really hope you do, I have a very good video about this up on Moodle. Anyway, when Mao died, the leadership pretty much abandoned his economic uh, and political radicalism. The message basically was, enjoy your newfound wealth, sign of the mandate of heaven, and keep your mouth shut. Chinese university students in particular did not want to shut up. They started asking for more political freedom. To their credit, they wanted more from life than blue jeans and rock music. But the story did not end well. The student protests were put down brutally by the military and political oppression continued. Today, China leads the world in efforts to control the internet and to clog the information highway. I wish them abject failure. And in fact, I'm counting on your generation's computer wizards to keep the lanes of the information highway open, including the highway to China. So this work, which is called an installation, a large-scale work, was shown in China in 1988, just before the massacre. 
The authorities soon cracked down on what to their minds was subversive work, and the artist fled to the United States, where he worked for 18 years. He now once again resides in Beijing. Like many of the works we've seen, this is a tribute to an older cultural tradition. Zhu Bing painstakingly carved all of these wooden blocks in the traditional way, and he printed up reams and reams of pages in his book from the sky. This kind of wood block printing was an ancient Chinese technology, although we've seen it was later used by the Japanese to produce prints for the mass market. And by the way, this was not printing press. It was prints directly imposed on paper. So what made this a subversive work instead of a tribute to the ancient Chinese arts of printing and calligraphy? Well, the answer is that these meticulously carved wood blocks and printed characters, there are some 4,000 of them, are complete nonsense words. These characters mean nothing to the Chinese. The communist officials thought they must be some kind of dangerous secret code, but in fact, they're just Lots and lots of meaningless characters. Chinese audiences can't read this work any better than we can, although at first they expect to, which makes their experience of the work rather different from that of non-Chinese speaking or reading Westerners. And by the way, it would be a good thing to remember if you got a question about how different audiences or different cultures view the same work. So what's the artist's point? The original title was Mirror to Analyze the World, the Century's Final Volume, and this suggests it was a commentary on the 20th century. But the artist later changed the name to Ianshu. In Chinese, this means divine writing, and it originally referred to certain kinds of religious texts, but its current meaning, what it's, how it's used now, is to mean gibberish. Interesting. The work is likewise a commentary on mass production and commercialism, which clearly influenced and made it possible. And of course, the artist is attacking government propaganda from Mao's little red book on. Finally, this may be a commentary on the meaninglessness of language or on our inability to communicate or on the meaninglessness of life in our technological age. As you've probably guessed from all these possible explanations, the artist has not provided a def definitive explanation of his own work. He wants us to figure it out for ourselves. And we'll see a lot of that when we get to 20th and 21st century uh, works, where meaning becomes much more ambiguous and in many ways more subjective. We will come back to this work in the spring when we look at global contemporary works and especially at political protest art. But I really felt that a book from the sky fit into this unit as well as an answer to Mao and as a shout out to those older Chinese artistic and cultural traditions that we've looked at. I've actually given you everything you need to answer the test questions, but if you'd like to know more or would feel more comfortable knowing more, the Khan Academy video about this work is up on Moodle and it's only about five minutes long. So I talked about this in my podcast and the slide gives you a big hint. Here are some general multiple choice questions. The question about Yamato E technique is probably the hardest, but all of the answers except the wrong answer, the except answer, were on my list. Now, some of the slides on this test review podcast come from the Unit 4 test review podcast, and there's a good reason for that. The test questions appear as well. So you all recognize this image, I hope. Where is it located? What religious tradition is it associated with? What ruler commissioned this work? What spiritual activity largely took place uh, on this site? In other words, how did the worshipers perform their act of worship? What other works that you've studied involve the same ritual? What was the primary function of this building? By the way, you want to know the, the precise vocabulary terms to answer these questions, and I think you do know them. What other Buddhist work did this influence? And hint, it has multiples of this kind of structure, but only in its upper or more heavenly layers. Remember that the College Board will sometimes ask you to attribute a work that you haven't seen to an artist whom you've studied. This one should not be tough, especially when you see that Mount Fuji appears in all four of these prints. And yes, one of these images is the image on the test. So who's the artist? And this is a reminder of why we're making you learn all those names on the matching test. And I realize that the Asian names are going to be difficult for many of you, just as European names are undoubtedly difficult for Asian students. So what was the purpose of making these works? Remember that they're prints, and remember how Japanese society was changing in this period. Who was buying art? 
What advantage did Prince offer? I talked about this in my Japan podcast. I also mentioned this, although I plan to talk about it more in the spring. What Western development did the artist borrow? A technique he'd seen in books about Italian Renaissance and Dutch Baroque paintings. Dutch works were available for the most part in Japan. The Dutch were the only country the Japanese were allowed to trade with, and contact with the Dutch was very strictly limited. So... This slide gives you a really big hint, and if you still don't recognize what technique this is, which you're going to be talking about a lot in January, check out your textbook from pages 84 to 89. So what's new about this work, and what's old? What event does this poster commemorate? What is striking and perhaps unusual about the faces on these terracotta soldiers? There are several image-based questions about this work. So what was their function? What were they made for? Remember that we know the precise answer to that question because of the inscription. What kind of images appear on the vases, and where might the artist have gotten the idea for these images? Uh, these two Shang Dynasty works on the right give you a very big hint. What are they made of, by the way? What information did the inscription provide? This is an accept question. I think it's one of the harder questions on the test. So you need to know what's on the inscription. What material are these made from? And you need to know a little detail about how the work was made. Again, I talked about this in my podcast, and it's discussed in your readings as well. But to help you out, here's a slide I borrowed from another teacher that gives you some more information. It does not talk about the difference between the underglazes that produce the blue designs and the overglazes that were used by the Ming Dynasty to create more colorful porcelains with enamel, essentially melted glass. I talked about this in my podcast. Where was this work found? Why did art historians originally think it had been intended only for use as a burial garment? And why is it still clear that it was not used frequently? Kings didn't just hang around their throne rooms wearing this crown. What do the various projections on the crown uh, symbolize? Those upright elements. What do they probably represent? What Chinese philosophy primarily, be careful with this one, primarily influenced this artist and this work? What is the relationship between people and nature in this philosophy? That alone should be a big hint. And in this painting, what kinds of materials and brush strokes did this artist employ? And I'll give you a hint. It's similar techniques to those used in our modern work, Summer Trees. What do Tibetan Buddhists believe about the origin of this statue? What was the meaning of this erotic sculpture to Hindu worshipers? How was the viewer meant to use the space? And the hint is the viewer did not enter the garden. Also remember that from no vantage point could one see every single piece of rock. That's, that's typical of Buddhist-inspired art. It's the idea that we cannot fully grasp reality since we're not yet enlightened. So which other required work probably influenced the great Buddha from the Todaiji Temple Complex? A hint, there is, this is a Verokana Buddha. What other huge work is also a Verokana Buddha? And what are Verokana Buddhas? What earlier giant Buddha from further west probably influenced both of these works? So these two images appear together in some of the questions. What political purpose did the temple on the bottom serve for the rulers who built it? What other Buddhist or Hindu work that's not shown here has a similar ornately carved exterior? Here's the floor plan for the upper temple from the previous slide. Why does it have such a narrow interior? And as a hint, it's the same reason why the Temple of Amun-Re narrows to smaller and darker passages. And in our last unit, we talked about the difference between this and Christian churches, which were basically designed to enclose and welcome much larger congregations. What do these works have in common? And we're done. Good luck on the test and on the semester final. Just think of how much you've learned and how much you've accomplished since August. You're going to have Christmas break off unless you want to write some extra credit essays. You've earned your break. You've been working hard, and I'm impressed.